Helping someone take their life is a crime in Canada, punishable by up to 14 years in prison. But any day now, that could change. The Supreme Court is deciding if the law against assisted suicide is unconstitutional and should be struck down. Until and unless that happens, some Canadians say they'll be forced to go underground to help a loved one end their life. And as Sophie Louis reports, that can have devastating consequences. Yeah. Do you know that when they got married, they only knew how to cook one thing between them and it was dad that actually knew how to cook it? <laughs> I did not know you that. You didn't know that story? No, I did not know that. On the short trip from Vancouver to Bowen Island, Sarah and Guy Bennett reminisce about their parents. And, like, and every Sunday, they would make, so dad would make the pastry, they'd make custard squares, they'd ice them, mm -hmm. and um, they'd buy um, a newspaper, maybe a London Times, and they'd spend the day reading it together. That's and, cute. Um, Eating custard squares. That's really And that sweet. was the start of their, of their marriage. That's you didn't really know sweet. that story. No, 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 no that's a good one. Sarah and Guy are checking in on their father, Jonathan, alone for the first time in 57 years since their mother died three months ago. Well, I think Dad's doing really well. She took her own life at home on Bowen Island. It was not a surprise. They knew it was going to happen. Isn't it funny that we still have stories about mom that, that the other one doesn't know? It is That's odd, bizarre. That is bizarre. Jillian had talked about it for ages, first broaching the subject of suicide 15 years before her death. Hey, Dad. There you both are. Nice to see you, Dad. Sarah, Sarah <laughs> said you looked skinny, right? It just came so out of left field, and it kind of forced me to briefly and superficially confront being parentless, which is something I had not begun to think about. And, uh, you know, I didn't get angry or anything, but I just remember telling him that I didn't want to talk about it, basically. And I was, I was miffed. Jillian had early symptoms of dementia and wanted to die before the disease consumed her mind. After that first family discussion, death became regular dinner conversation at Bennett gatherings. And I remember she said she used this fantastic English phrase. She said, she said, I have no intention of rotting in public. Mm -hmm. And um, then slowly as, as the years went by, I came to see that this was not, not, not a whim, but was a very, one of the, one of, if not the central concern of her life, mm -hmm. to control her own, or to control her own exit. One weekend in August, Jillian summoned her children to the family home for a final goodbye. She called us on a Wednesday and said, um, I'm gonna be gone uh, on Monday by noon. Could you guys come and visit this weekend? I'd love you guys to come and visit. So of course we came and visited and we knew it would be the last weekend. It was completely clear it was what she wanted. It was beyond clear. It was not a whim and it was not a symptom of her dementia. Jillian procured a lethal dose of a barbiturate called Nembutol, doing it in secret, covering her tracks. Jillian didn't want her family involved in any of that. Bless her heart, she wouldn't let any of us know. She said to me, um, she said, I don't want you to go to jail and you're a rotten liar. Can you hear the stream? Can you hear? Surprised. Jillian knew she had to end her life while she was still mentally competent. She knew if anyone else helped her die, that would be a crime. I think it's too bad they had to be so careful that she couldn't have had any help. But I understand how the law is. You have, that's how it had to be. So the main terms are that he's confined to his residence. A cautionary tale. Five other Canadians have been criminally charged with assisting a suicide. Thank you, I'm sorry, no problem. Two were acquitted, three were convicted. If I cannot give consent to my own death, whose body is this? 
Sue Rodriguez launched a charter challenge that went to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1993. She argued that the law preventing assisted suicide interfered with her security of the person and liberty. The law was upheld by the court. The criminal code is fairly clear in that, uh, that it states that anybody who counsels, aids, or abets somebody to commit suicide, of course, is in violation of the criminal code. 21 years later, the same issue is back before the Supreme Court in Carter versus Canada. The court will decide whether Section 241 of the Criminal Code infringes on a person's rights and freedoms. If the laws change, people who feel they have no other options, many with debilitating and terminal illnesses, may finally have the right to a medicalized assisted suicide. You basically lose your autonomy and your dignity and your self-esteem and, and you know there's nowhere but down and not up. Elaine Chapre fears there is no up for her. Diagnosed in the 1980s with multiple sclerosis, the 68-year-old requires constant care. Wait, how you do it? Her grandchildren know that when they hug their bubby, she cannot hug them back. And so she has joined the landmark Supreme Court case and is hoping for a change in the law so she can control the circumstances of her death legally. Can you take them off the stem where it is? Yeah. Uh, okay. I only put half in so you didn't choke. Your mind is the same as it's always been. Yes. It's your body. It's my body. And I said to them, one day I'm going to be a body attached to a head that works. That's a pretty horrible picture. You don't want that for yourself? I don't want that for myself. What do you want? I want peace. What I want to know is when enough is enough, but there's a doctor out there who'll say enough is enough and there would be physician-assisted dying. That's why I'm so in favor of it. Hello, Kay. Hello, Dr. Johnson. Right now, the Canadian Medical Association does not support assisted suicide. <clears throat> How have you been feeling? Good. Yes, very well, actually. Everyone always says that they're well, and then they tell me all of the ways they're not. <laughs> Dr. Will Johnston, BC Chair of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, says current laws are there to protect the vulnerable. Excellent. So I think we have to be very, very careful about agreeing with suicidal people that their lives are not worth living. You may think you're winning uh, under a new law, but all you're actually doing is giving protection to people around them to steer them towards suicide. Elaine won't say what her exact end-of-life plans are, but she's losing hope that there will ever be a legal way to end her suffering. There are no drugs on the market for secondary progressive MS. And there won't be for a long time. So, I think you went uh, for, for your, your blood thinner check when you were up at the island, didn't you? I did. Dr. Johnston wants Canadians to know that for every illness, every symptom, there are solutions for living as comfortably as possible even in the final moments of life. This horror of disability is what motivates some people to throw away their lives because they're anticipating a future state of, of horror. I think it's quite clear that no one in Canada needs to die in pain. Elaine is anticipating future horror and she wants other options. Unless the court decides to strike down Section 241 of the Criminal Code, Elaine and people like her, who want to control how they die, can't get the help of a qualified physician or anyone else. They know what they're doing. It's safe. It's quick. It's easy. And I think otherwise, having people going into a back alley on Hastings Street and trying to buy drugs, you're going to be find out that you're in the hospital because the drugs didn't work or any such thing like that is pretty horrific. Horrific for you and you're horrific for your family. Next, 
changing laws for the end of life. It was entirely peaceful, painless and peaceful, and she was absolutely calm. August 18th, 2014. I will take my life today around noon, Gillian Bennett wrote. It is time. Dementia is taking its toll and I have nearly lost myself. I have nearly lost me. Jonathan, the straightest and brightest of men, will be at my side as a loving witness. This is the spot. This is the spot. She had the, she had the mattress here, just a foam rubber thing, you know under pillow. <clears throat> she lay down, head there, feet there, facing there. And um, swallowed her stuff. And I helped her lie down. And it can't have been more than three minutes when it was clear to me that she was no longer conscious. Jillian had taken a lethal dose of barbiturates and washed them down with some whiskey. So I phoned our doctor, who came as soon as she could and confirmed that Jillian was dead. And then the police came, of course. Because it wasn't a natural death, the police had to investigate. The coroner had to examine Jillian's body. Her daughter, Sarah, came from where she had been waiting on the other side of the island. It took a long time. Mom's body lay out there for five hours. And Dad and I were, were interrogated by the police. Mm. How did you feel about all of that? I understood. I understood it had to be that way. It wasn't ideal. I was super relieved that mom and dad had been so careful that my dad you know, wasn't in any way involved and, and didn't have to you know, get arrested or, mm. or charged with anything because he didn't do anything, but they were careful. Mm. They were careful with that. As Jillian's death was being investigated, her final message was released to the world. Her blog, Dead at Noon, went live. We just removed the password and it, it became live and anyone could, could read it. She was very clear that it, she wanted it to be after her death. Jillian wrote, the medical profession, the law and the church will challenge and fight any transformative change. Yet we all hear of changes in each of these professions that suggest a broader approach, guided and informed by empathy. She just wanted to start a conversation, and that is exactly what she did. To be fair, reignite one. Dr. Will Johnston, BC Chair of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, is concerned that conversation is colored by a few outspoken fringe activists. So we have a very small number of suicide advocates. The, the volunteers for the Right to Die societies tend to be people who have seen uh, badly managed end-of-life experiences for their family members or their friends. She did it by herself. She had collected a number of pills and then uh, she popped them as best as she could. Mark Bauer visits his sister Ronnie Dunn in the dark room she hasn't left in two years. Hey, Ronnie. It's Mark. Her disease, Friedrich's ataxia, brother? eroded her body. When she decided it was too much for her, she tried to end her life. You have a busy day today. One could say Ronnie is a casualty of the current laws. Bruce Ryder, a constitutional law expert, says people like Ronnie, who are desperate to die, 
are taking matters into their own hands so they don't get anyone into trouble with the law. The difficulty now with a blanket prohibition on assisted suicide, no exemptions, is that decisions get driven underground, so to speak. Ronnie was one of those who went underground to try to end her life. It wasn't the right medication to take if she wanted to do the job, but it was enough to put her into a coma which may have taken her life. A suicide attempt with catastrophic results. Ronnie overdosed on drugs prescribed to her to manage a symptom of her Friedrich's ataxia. And Ronnie was in a coma for two, three days. And the first word out of her mouth when she woke up was, why? Why did you resuscitate me? I'm over here. Ronnie is now worse off than before. In addition to being unable to walk, hear, or really talk. I'm sorry, what, what did you say? The drugs she took left her unable to move, blind, her eyes sensitive to light. She lies in a darkened room. That's life for her. And I think that's a life she didn't want for herself. She didn't want to end up that way. According to an Ipsos Reid poll, 84% of Canadians surveyed said a doctor should be able to help someone end their life if the person is a competent adult who is terminally ill, suffering unbearably, and repeatedly asks for assistance to die. Despite that growing demand for law reform, members of parliament have not been willing to take it on. I think the Supreme Court of Canada is likely to say, you no longer have a choice. Ryder suspects the Supreme Court of Canada will decide to strike down Section 241 of the Criminal Code that makes aiding or abetting a suicide a criminal offence. The court will say, in essence, Parliament, you need to visit this issue, come up with a charter-compliant law to replace the current law because it's unconstitutional. Okay. Physically and mentally, Ronnie was ready to leave the world, and today her wish remains the same. But as it stands, she has no option other than to wait for death or a change in the law. I'm really sorry right now, but I don't know what to do, but that's just my life, I don't want a family member to add my life for me, I want a pill that makes it legal. That gives everyone the right to do Jillian Bennett didn't live to see the outcome of the Supreme Court of Canada case, but her suicide on a sleepy BC island has made a loud political statement. Was it peaceful for her, do you think? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. She swallowed the stuff and just went. It was entirely peaceful, painless and peaceful, and she was absolutely calm and confident that she was doing the right thing. Sorry, I'm crying. I'm crying for me. I miss her terribly. Coming up next week on 16 by 9, the crisis among Canada's first responders and the psychological scars no one sees. Everybody wants to know, so everybody asks, what's the worst thing you've seen? Decapitations, amputations. Those sounds and sights never leave you. There comes a point when we fracture. We're taught to be tough. Suck it up, don't say anything. 
so we suffer in silence. I couldn't continue, so I started drinking. And that's when I informed her that I had thoughts of, of suicide. Mental illness is still, to this day, an issue in the organization. Shouldn't you be taking a serious look at whether what you're doing is working? We could, yes. Uh, are we doing that right now? No. These are the people there to protect you, and they won't be there to protect you. We need help. Thank <laughs> you.